Good evening from Charlottetown. This is the 2023 Leaders Debate on CBC. We are live tonight at the Confederation Center of the Arts in Charlottetown, PEI, located in the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. I'm Louise Martin. I will be your monitor for tonight's debate. We are going to introduce our leaders tonight in alphabetical order of the parties they represent. So, beginning with Green Party leader Peter Bevan Baker. Welcome. Thank you. Liberal leader Sharon Cameron. The leader of the New Democratic Party, Michelle Neal. Thank you. And leader of the Progressive Conservatives, Dennis King. Thank you all for being with us tonight. I'm really Thanks looking forward to this. Here. So, more than 100 Islanders sent us questions for this debate. They wanted to hear about certain topics. I'm sure you can guess a lot of them. <laughs> so tonight, here's how it will work. The leaders will have 45 seconds to answer each one of them, and then we'll open up for debate. We'll also have some rapid fire questions in there, so 30 seconds, those will not be open for debate. And then our evening will end with one minute closing statements. And we did draw names before we went to air for who would get the first question tonight. And so that honor goes to Peter Bevan Baker, Green Party leader. And we are beginning with healthcare. Oh, surprise. <laughs> A lot of questions about health care. So, Sharon McDonald sent us this question. Doctors have said urgent action is required to avoid the PEI health system collapsing. What is the one thing you would do immediately to prevent that from happening? The one thing the Green Party would do and will do immediately is to increase the salaries of every single frontline health care worker by 15%. There are many, many problems in the system, many things that have to be fixed, but one of the major problems is retaining the people that we have here. The loss of experienced healthcare professionals is devastating for the system. So, of course, we need to recruit more people, we need more workers, but we have to retain the experienced ones that we have. And when we're not competitive in wages with our neighboring provinces, that's a big problem. So a 15% across the board wage increase, which is in our platform for all frontline healthcare workers, is the first thing that we would do. Thank you. Liberal leader Sharon Cameron. Thank you. Healthcare is coming up a lot uh, on the, the doorsteps, and we would also make some significant investments in healthcare as well. But I think the thing that's different for us is it's not just the uh, the money, the um, additional positions in, and we know in nursing and doctors, but it's also some structural changes to the system because what I get asked a lot is, well, what's different? Everybody's saying that they'll put other invest uh, extra investments into healthcare, but we know that it, it needs transformational change as well. And we know that we're, we have, we're in a system that was developed a long time ago, and the system also needs some changes, so we don't just put extra people into a broken system. All right, thank you. Dennis King. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint one, but I think the frustration many islanders have is accessing health care in a timely way as close to home as possible. Uh, that's why we have made the investments we have made uh, to make sure you can get in to get the treatment you need as quickly as you can with things like Pharmacy Plus. Uh, we're using technology as well, but we're also working with healthcare professionals and the many of the experts who want to work in a collaborative system of delivery. That's why we have our patient medical homes. We have 14 of those set up. Uh, we'll have 14 set up by the end of this month and we'll have another 17 added to that in the next 18 months. So we're excited about the changes, but we are, but we know there's challenges ahead. Uh, there isn't just one magic button uh, that we can push to fix healthcare, but I think if we improve access, uh, Islanders will be better served. Okay. Michelle Neal. Thank you very much. Uh, there isn't a family on Prince Edward Island that's not affected by trying to access health care. So it's extremely important to all islanders, of course. I'm not sure if all islanders are aware, but where we set aside uh, we are different than the other parties is that we don't want to be giving our public taxpayer funds to a private uh, shareholder, such as Galen Weston, through the Maple App, which is owned by Shoppers Drug Mart and in part by Galen Weston. So we want to ensure that all public funds that come from the federal and provincial governments that are earmarked for health care are put right to the front lines to invest in our health care workers, which stay back here on PEI. We also want to fast track some of the licensing so that we can get our foreign trained uh, people that are both islanders and from away back into the system as quickly as possible. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, question number two, we'll begin with Liberal Leader Sharon Cameron. 
there are currently, this is also a healthcare related question, 28,000 people on the patient registry uh, waiting for a family doctor. And that has actually doubled in the last four years. So because of that, more people are forced to go to emergency rooms to seek care. So how do you get people timely access to the health care that they need? Thank you for that. First of all, I, I was remiss in, in wanting to acknowledge the frustrated people that are outside, uh, wanting their collective agreements uh, settled. And uh, I also should have said uh, congratulations to Michelle and I being 50% of the, the leadership here as being female, so congratulations to that. The first thing we would want to do is make sure that we have all kinds of options for people um, for primary access to primary health care. And that is and because we need to take pressure off the emergency room. So we want to bring in new doctors right away. We want to look at scope of practice because we know that uh, nurse practitioners and pharmacists have told us that they could do more. Uh, we want to uh, provide incentives for students to um, to be, be uh, employable in our healthcare system too. So we have, and, and access to Maple and other kinds of uh, s um, services to take the pressure off the, the emergency room. Okay, thank you, Dennis King. Yeah, uh, well, we've tried to be the political party that didn't make the promise that others have made in the past, a doctor for every islander and knowing that you cannot provide that service. But what we're trying to provide is access to care. I think this system that was built in the 1950s is really stale dated and it doesn't serve islanders well. And we end up with people in the emergency room, for example, because they're being put in the wrong line. So trying to open up access points or what I've been referring to as pressure release valves on the system for those who work within it, but also those who are accessing the system is a better way of accessing the care that you need. And we have the best healthcare system in the world when you can get in to get at it. If we can make it easier for you to access it as an Islander, uh, we think you will be better served. That's what we've done for four years, and that's what we'd like to do for the next four years. Okay, Michelle Neer, this is uh, Michelle Neer, just reminding the question that, you know, how do people get timely access to the health care they need? Well, it's interesting. I can tell you a personal story myself. When I was traveling in Nova Scotia in the fall of 2021, I became quite ill and had to go to the emergency room. And I, I went to a local one that was five minutes away, but it was closed because it was after eight o'clock. So we had to drive another hour and a half to be able to get to a, uh, an ER that was open. So I understand when people say they need timely access and they need to ensure that it's available where they need it as well. So we need to ensure that we can um, make sure that we have enough doctors that are able to be able to run the ER system, but we also need to ensure that there's long-term beds for seniors who are currently in the healthcare system in the hospitals, move them into the long-term care homes. So that will open up some extra room in our emergency rooms and in our hospitals as well. So it's, it's a working together. Yeah. Peter Bevan Baker. Almost every problem that you can imagine in the healthcare system, whether that is access for primary care close to where you live, whether that is arriving at a walk-in clinic to find that all the places have been taken before it even opens, whether it's waiting for a test, whether it is waiting for surgery for cataracts or hips, all of these things are delayed and made difficult because we do not have enough frontline healthcare workers. The old-fashioned model of funneling everybody into the, um, into the primary healthcare system through a, a, a GP has changed. And the progressive jurisdictions are doing it with we call them now medical homes. Medical hubs is what we described them in our platform from four years ago. I'm delighted that they are now in place. And that allows all healthcare workers to work to their full scope and to work collaboratively together. All right. How about a healthcare debate? Anyone can jump in. Okay. So Sharon yeah. mentioned in her first answer that we need to transform the healthcare system. I absolutely agree. And let's remember that the healthcare system that we are laboring under and that healthcare workers are struggling with was created by the Liberal and Tory governments. They are hell bent on maintaining control of decision making in a system that they have no need to be in. What we need to do is to take the political meddling out of the system, allow Health PEI to have the autonomy and the authority that it needs to do its proper job get the politics out of the healthcare system. And if we do that, and it's a simple change, it's a legislative change. Uh, four years ago, the Liberal government removed all of the authority for health PEI to do the job it needs to do. Dennis King has had four years to reverse that and give health PEI back the liberty and the, and the autonomy that it needs to do its job, and he has failed on that. The problem with the system, it does need to be transformed, but let's remember who created the problems in the first place. It's the old parties. 
Interestingly enough, I've heard from quite a few doctors that are in the various districts where I've been doing some door knocking, and they're very, very frustrated with the fact that there's not enough support for them in the administrative roles. They're spending almost half of their time doing paperwork, and that is one of the things that they're saying has not been supported for them. That's something that we need to change. We shouldn't be paying a doctor their, their salary to be doing paperwork that can be done by an administrative assistant. That's one of the reasons why they're leaving. We have to listen to our health care workers. So what I'd like to say, and I'm, I'm really glad you raised that for a couple of reasons. You've also had four years to provide good uh, opposition, which is one of the reasons why I'm here tonight. And you talked about, you know, being proud of passing, I think, 18 uh, pieces of legislation. I think I checked on those. There might have only been two or three that were health care related. And then I'm going to go over to the Premier and say, you know, Premier, um, you keep saying we have the best health care system uh, maybe in, in the country. Things have never been better than the, they have been the last four years. What do you say to the 30,000 people and the seniors who haven't had a doctor for six to eight years? What do you say to them, and how do you convince them that this is the best health care system we've ever had? Well, I guess I would say to them that there's no magic bullet to fix this, and I know there's lots of talk, particularly over these last 25 days, about all the challenges, and we know what challenges are there. The only way you address the challenges is to work with the people within the system to come up with new and collaborative solutions that can serve individuals better. The finger-pointing uh, might make you feel good for a moment, but it doesn't get anything done in terms of actual, uh, you know, boots on the ground and getting things done. So when we've implemented Pharmacy Plus, for example, there's over 20,000 islanders who used to have to go to the ER or they used to have to go to a walk-in clinic uh, to get service that they're now getting service for for up to 32 uh, common ailments. That's a wonderful service. Uh, the Maple app has 27,000 appointments where islanders are getting access to some type of health care service that they used to have to wait a long time to get. There's no magic bullet to fix this. If there was a magic button, I promise you I would have pressed it on the first day. Uh, Wade McLaughlin before me would have pressed it on the first day. Robert Giz before him would have pressed it on the first day. But there are no simple solutions here. We have to roll up our sleeves and find some island solutions to serve our island population. Louise, if I may follow up, because I think it's really critical that islanders are made aware of just how effective the Green Party opposition has been. Not only that we passed 18 pieces of legislation, many of them health care, but we have held this government's feet to the fire for four years. Fully a third of the Liberal caucus, and maybe, maybe the leader of the Liberal Party isn't aware of this, but they bailed. They left their jobs. They did not fulfill their commitment as MLAs to their, the people of their districts over the last term in office. So talk about a lack of commitment to, to opposition. It certainly didn't sit in our corner. It sat in the corner of the, of the Liberals who, who bailed on their duties and left, uh, allowed this government to, to form a majority which changed the, the, the face of politics here on Prince Edward Island. And what I'd like to say, too, I, I want to talk about, there's a big difference between meddling, as uh, Mr. Bevan Baker would call it, and leadership. And we have neither. So they have, there's a difference between having a vision and listening to people. We've been listening to people for months. We've listened to the unions. We've listened to the doctors. We've listened to the medical society. And they're all saying the same thing. And by the way, they're saying the same thing that Derek Key said who said, we need a plan, we need leadership, and we need vision. That's different than getting involved in the operations, and that's what's lacking from both these two parties. So can I ask a question of all three of you, actually? I did send a letter to each of you on February the 2nd asking for a commitment to join the NDP and us in making sure that all public funds that come from the federal government and from the provincial for, that are earmarked for health care stays in the public health care system so that we can reinvest right in our frontline people. That money is then being spent here on PEI to ensure that that money stays invested here rather than sending it to privatization, which goes into into the pockets of uh, shareholders that generally don't live on PEI. Mm -hmm. So why did I hear crickets? Why did I not get a response? So, Michelle, I think that's a really complicated... And I'm glad you asked that question, too, because I think it's a complicated question, because we have to remember that it depends on how you define privatization, because doctors are, can be private business, pharmacists are private business. So I think we need to have a good, frank discussion about what privatization means. But right now, when we're in crisis and we're bleeding doctors and bleeding nurses, we need to make sure that we can find ways for people to get into the system and be monitored for chronic health care and 
conditions and to have their you know health issues taken care of and uh, and but let's have that serious conversation because I think we need to understand what privatization really means. I'll, I'll let you both respond to, to Michelle Neal. Yes. Sure. So the couple of fundamental things about the tenets of of health care here in Canada and, of course, here on Prince Edward Island. One is that your ability to receive health care can never be dependent on your ability to pay for it. That's absolutely critical. It has to be paid for out of the public purse. And when we, when we look at all of the, the elements of the Canada Health Act, a federal act, the fact that it has to be comprehensive, it has to be universal, it has to be publicly administered, it has to be accessible, it has to be portable, all of these things provincial governments must comply with. And the problem with the Maple app, as you have just suggested, of being a, a, of here on Prince Edward Island, is that it's not universal currently. Some people are able to access it, but if you have a doctor, you are not. You have to pay for it. And that's in violation of the Canada Health Act. But this is a fundamental way that so many islanders access health care with a, a lack of doctors here, a lack of health care workers. Many people access the system through Maple, and they love it. And we have to make that universal. But at the same time, we have to be working to make that maple system, it doesn't have to be maple, but that online healthcare, telehealth, we have to make that universally available to everybody so we comply with the Canada Health Act and we have to bring it into the public system, right. either by bu buying the, the, the developed apps that already exist um, or developing our own. But that's the problem with it. We really need doctors. Yeah, M Mr. I, King, I'll, we'll sure. respond and then we'll move on. But go you, ahead, Louise, please. Thank you. I think the reality is uh, we're a growing population. The population that is here is aging and living longer, which is wonderful. Uh, but it puts uh, an extra challenge on the system that we have to offer at a time when health human resources are less and they're being more competitively sought after in every jurisdiction around the world. So we have to embrace technology. We embrace technology for banking. Uh, I can lock my, my garage door from my phone. I can do so much on my phone. Why shouldn't I be able to access parts of the healthcare system? I should. We have to work with the professionals that are within our system. I was the first premier in the history of PEI who brought all of the individual groups together from healthcare and said, this is our team. What can we do together to, to deliver better healthcare? What more can you do? What more can another group do? That's how Pharmacy Plus was born. And we have to continue to find the innovations. We have to work with the professionals who are here, who are wonderful, who are amazing and are capable of doing more. Uh, we've demonstrated that for four years, and I would like to demonstrate that again for the next four years. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to move on. Uh, actually, Dennis King, you, you get the first shot at, at this next question. Uh, this one was sent in to us by Ryan Shaw. Um, mental health is something I am passionate about. You're told to call, visit a clinic when you feel these thoughts, but in some cases find yourself being turned away. How will you and your party address the ongoing mental health crisis? Yeah, that's another avenue where we've tried to increase the access. So uh, right off the bat, we, we opened up the single point of access where you can call one number and you can get into access services, not just offered by the government, but also many of our important NGO uh, partners who offer this wonderful service all across PEI. Uh, I, I do believe we have good health care when you can get in there. I don't apologize for saying that. I think that's a support of the people in the system who do a wonderful job. Uh, we've made it difficult to get in. Uh, we know our mobile mental health unit as well as something that we've implemented. We have them uh, operating across Prince Edward Island. Uh, we're working with groups like the Alliance for Mental Wellbeing who are working with many other partners to offer that service we need for those suffering from mental health and addictions. Uh, and uh, I think we have a reasonable uh, proud tra our track record to be proud of and I'd like to build upon it. Michelle Neal. Thank you. Basically, people should not be left alone to try and deal with a lot of the mental health issues that are uh, evident. Of course, with the pandemic, things were made quite a bit worse as well. Um, there are people that are stressed from v various different issues that are coming forward, and we need to ensure that they have the proper mental health care at wherever they are and as quickly as possible, because we don't want them to wait. Right now, a lot of the systems is just based on acute or emergency situations, but there are people who need care all the time. So we need to ensure that we have mental health therapy available through our PEI health card. We need to ensure that they can choose the best services that they need that works for them and ensure that we develop community-based youth programs as well to prevent uh, as a preventative measure as well. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So clearly the first thing that has to be done is actually to fulfill the promise of the Premier 
which is to build the mental health campus here on Prince Edward Island. That was a shovels on day one, if you will remember, promise. And actually, we're now further behind than the previous government who promised to do that. So um, this is an urgent issue. Uh, I'm not quite sure why this government has failed so badly to do that. But a mental health, health campus is just, of course, bricks and mortar. We have to have people in order to make it work properly. And that access to mental health professionals is sorely lacking. We know that 25% of people who attend emergency departments are there for mental health issues. And without, again, going back, it's the same thing. We do not have enough frontline uh, health care workers, in this case, mental health specialists, in order to help people. Sherry Cameron. Thank you. So we know that about one, one in three um, Canadians will be affected by mental health issues in their lifetime. Uh, we know that it's also um, a situation that needs to be developed or needs to be addressed from a preventative approach right through to intervention. Uh, services in PEI haven't kept up with the demand. And I think COVID really exposed a lot of um, more situations around mental health and how deeply people were affected. What we want to do is treat this so seriously that we want to separate it out from uh, health and give it its own department so that it has the full focus of, of, a, of its own department, its own minister. We also want to expand mel mental health clinics and mobile mental health units to give access 24-7. Uh, we want to increase the number of psychiatrists in the province, and we also want to make sure that psychologists have access to billing service. Thank you. You're out of time. But that's yeah. <laughs> Okay. So, you know, let's let's open this up then for, for a bit of a debate before we get to the next question. Whoever wants to jump in. I'd like to know, uh, first of all, my big question that I've been asking for months is uh, why our premier, along with all of the other premiers in Canada, met with our prime minister, got an extra $50 million to invest in our health care system and came back to our province when everybody else in the country went back to plan for health care and ours came back to plan for an election. So I'd like to know... Uh, I'd like to ask this directly to the Premier. How much of that $50 million is allocated towards mental health? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, the uh, Canada Health uh, funding agreement that we were negotiating with the Prime Minister uh, will probably come into full action sometime at the end of June, I think is what uh, we had uh, been promised from the federal government. I know they're doing a federal uh, budget tomorrow. We expect there's some more goodies in there as well uh, for, uh, for islanders, uh, not just in health, but in other departments. But, uh, you know, the, the money that we need to invest in health care, in mental health, uh, some and a lot of it is earmarked to go to the front lines to pay people more who are in the system who need to be paid more, and, and we're committed to doing that. But it also needs to continue to pay for innovation. It needs to pay for new systems of delivery so that islanders can get access to the care they need. Uh, we're putting $200 million into a mental health uh, campus, which will be one of the state-of-the-art facilities probably in North America. We're excited about that. It's about, a, uh, you know... A 40% on its way to being completed. It's a huge project. It's the biggest capital project in the history of PEI that it wasn't the Confederation Bridge. So we're, we're, we're on the right path on a lot of these things, but we just need to continue uh, moving forward. We need to work with our professionals and work with our NGOs who do such a wonderful job on the ground where government can help is to kind of lead from the side when it comes to working with our NGOs. Uh, we can give them the resources, we can give them the money, and we can work side by side with them to deliver good service for islanders. And that's what we've done. Interesting that the Premier is proud of a project that is at least four years behind, and to say that it's 40% complete, I mean, I'd love to see the evidence that supports that statement, but of course, Islanders are perfectly... Um, we're very familiar with a Premier who will tell us one thing, and we have to, we have to double-check that that's indeed what's going on here. Um, I think Islanders have lost trust in this Premier, and we're not sure what to believe when it comes out of his mouth. We're not sure what sort of Dennis Premier we have, Dennis King we have in front of us. I'm not even sure that the Premier knows what he believes anymore. We see so many examples of bold statements like the mental health campus is 40% complete. I would invite all islanders to head down to the QEH, have a look, um, or the Hillsborough Hospital in that area. I'd love to see 40% of that campus complete. I would say it's probably nearer 4%. By the way, that was a liberal plan, and it was shovel-ready, which we were told four years ago it was shovel-ready, and, and we still don't have it. And we also have a delay on the, the, uh, 
the medical school, uh, it's delayed another year as well. So uh, I guess I'd, I'd agree with Peter as to, you know, why the delays and why say you're ready and can we believe that it's ready to go this time and how, how much longer will it take? Okay. Michelle, do you want to weigh in? Or? The thing is, with mental health, we have so many people who are in crisis. We can't wait three, four, five years. We yeah. just can't. People need the services right away. They need it, they, and they need long-term services for the most part. Now, I know there are some people out there who do have the services, and God bless, I hope that you continue to have your services. I really do. But there's so many who don't, and we need to ensure that they have those services so that they can continue to live a dignified life and give back to society. Thank you very much. You actually get to do the start the next question, but it's a, it's a thirty seconder, so so no debate on this one. Um, so Michelle Neal, how will you remove the barriers for foreign trained medical professionals to work on PEI? Well, thank you for this question because you know what? I've talked to quite a few doctors. In fact, I talked to a family of doctors, a husband and wife, who are from Sweden, and they have told me specifically they have friends who are doctors who want to come to PEI, but the barriers are the issue, the foreign trained credentials. You know what? Maybe we can fast track those that are trained in the Commonwealth. Their training is very, very similar to ours. We need to fix that system. We need to fast track them, pure and simple. Okay. Peter Bevan Baker. So I have personal experience with this, having a British dental degree coming to Canada and having to go through some pretty strenuous exams in order to, to uh, practice here. Uh, very similar programs and trainings. It's very clear that we have unnecessary barriers when it comes to allowing foreign trained healthcare workers, not just doctors, but all frontline healthcare workers coming into the country. I was really glad to see recently um, a, a sort of spearheading of the breaking down of red tape by the Atlantic premiers who, who allowed uh, people who are in one province to, to be accredited, accredited to all provinces. That's a start, but my goodness, we have a lot more work to do. Okay, Sharon Cameron. Thank you, Thank you for that. Uh, again, I would go back to the planning and the long-term planning. So we're, we keep having to talk about expediting services and making sure people have access. With good planning, we would have been able to see where all the pieces fit in a better way. So one of the things that I, I would like to say is that we would we want to talk to the nurses too, the existing nurses and value their input and develop a 10 year strategy, but also to fast track people from off island who want to come back. And I've heard many stories about people who have family members who want to come back and they should be allowed to come back. Dennis King. Yeah, this is something that every provincial government struggles with. This is, uh, you need to work with the College of Physicians uh, who look after their credentialing and they make sure that when a doctor is here practicing that they have the credentials that live up to what we expect for them to, to deliver for us, for patients. And you also have to work with the federal government through the Department of Immigration uh, to make sure that they're bringing people to the country that are safe and, and, and they go through the proper checks and balances. So this isn't something that you can just miraculously fix as a provincial government, but you can work with, like, we have with Atlantic premiers to break down some of the barriers and eliminate some of the red tape, which is frustrating the system. And I'm grateful that the College of Physicians here has been so open to work with us. They're amazing. Dr. Carruthers has been amazing. So, All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Peter Bevan Baker. We received many questions about housing, one of the other big topics. So all of you have pledged to build more. How will you do that when there is a labor shortage and there is not enough people to do the work to actually build the homes you're promising? Uh, that's an excellent, excellent question. And one of the major uh, bottlenecks in terms of us creating more housing here on Prince Edward Island, and we need at least 2,000 units per year just to keep up with the population growth, is the labor force. So I'm going to come back to that in a second. But I also want to say that the reason we are in such crisis at the moment is mismanagement by previous liberal and conservative governments who are very happy to have an aggressive population strategy. And there are all sorts of wonderful things that come along with that, but very little planning. And whether that's in the healthcare system, whether it's in childcare spaces, whether it's in housing, what we're talking about now, or infrastructure generally, we had governments that did not plan for this. And consequently, we've ended up in a housing crisis that is far worse than it needs to be. Sharon Cameron. So first of all, I'd, I would say that um, I would disagree with, with Peter Bevan Baker that we, the Liberals did have a, a plan. They had a housing plan and they did have a population strategy plan. What, what's, um, what's different, I think, is the population has doubled in a very, uh, a very uh, quick, uh, short amount of time. 
Um, but this isn't just about building. I think we also want to look at other options. And one of the things that people are really excited about that we announced today is that we have an own first program, which means if your household is making less than uh, 95000 we'll provide a subsidy on the first 200000 to get people in uh, to the housing market. So families who want their families to come back and raise their grandchildren are really excited about them being able to get into the labor market. So I just want to say it's a balanced approach and it's, it's not just at one end or another. Thank you. Dennis King. Yeah, I think the question was, how do you balance building versus the labor challenge that we have in the system? And uh, I think as of last uh, Thursday at the chamber debate, we had been the only party who actually sat down uh, with the Construction Association to say, what are we capable of building? What do we need to put our focus and how can we work together to make sure we can build the homes of tomorrow for those who need them, but make sure we have the labor to do so? Uh, because they do go uh, hand in glove uh, together. Uh, we have a very aggressive plan. I think we need to continue to build. We we need to work with the private sector. Uh, we need to work, uh, there needs to be more government-owned homes. Uh, we need to have, uh, uh, we're very happy with our rent-to-own uh, policy that we're putting in place, which will get people on the pathway to home ownership faster, which is important. Uh, there's a continuum here that we have to build upon, but we have to continue to build our labor pool as well so we have the people who can do the jobs and keep our economy going as we build new homes. Michelle Neal, how do you build without people? So we are going to invest in the people. We're going to ensure that those islanders who want to get into the construction industry, who want to be an electrician or a plumber, they're going to get their, their training for free through Holland College. So we're going to invest $15 million to be able to do that. So that will give us the tradespeople that we need to build the 5,000 public affordable homes that we want to build. And by affordable, we mean affordable based on your income, not on the market rates. So that's a big difference in what's going on right now. Uh, some of the building that's going on by the private developers are saying that they're building affordable, but $1,500 a month is just not affordable for someone on minimum wage. So we hear you, we get it, and we're gonna act, take action the way it should be done. Debate. I think it's important that, and I didn't answer this in the 45 seconds I had, but that we introduce programs and, and the, what Michelle just suggested is part of that in order to increase the labor force here. We all recognize that has to be done. One of the ways, one of the things we don't do really well here in PEI in Canada generally is connecting the high school programs with apprenticeships and post-secondary education, in our case, Holland College. And there are other countries that do a fantastic job of encouraging young people, both men and women, to go into the trades at high school, and then you connect that with the, give folks credit, so when they go into post-secondary education, they are already well on their way. The other thing we need to do is to look at the possibility of creating a wage grid here for workers, because currently anybody can pick up a hammer and call themselves a carpenter, and it's very difficult to compete with people who are trained properly at Holland College or, or elsewhere. So a wage grid would give some some clarity to employers and employees as to what you could expect to be paid because there are lots of wonderful jobs out there in the trades and we just have to create a system both within the school and, and post-secondary education and, and in, in the, uh, of course, in the marketplace to allow people to do that. I would like to, again, argue with Peter Bevan Baker that not everybody can pick up a hammer and call themselves a carpenter. I sure couldn't. So, oh, but... actually, you could. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I beg to differ. But I, I, what I would like to say, though, is that uh, absolutely we have some... I actually met with the, the Carpenters Association, and there, there are all kinds of training opportunities across PEI, and I think it's important, too, that the, the Liberal Party wants to expand on those training opportunities and kick out the, the, uh, the hurdles for Holland College and some other uh, programs at UPEI uh, so that we can enhance the labor force. But I think we need to also recognize that a lot of that good work is, is being done already and we wanna make sure that we support that work in terms of uh, developing the labor market. Yeah, a lot of that good work has been done because, I mean, I know like Holland College has programs now where if you're a carpenter or an electrician or a plumber and you want to go back and get more skills, you don't have to leave your job. Part of the job that you get paid to do uh, goes in against your credentialing and helps you with, her, with, with your on-the-job component so you can learn and train and upgrade on the job. And that's just one of the many innovations that we need to work with uh, with many of our post-secondary institutions because the, the realities of, of, of today are vastly different than they 
were 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, I think we do need, uh, I would agree with, uh, with Peter, we need to continue to recruit and to make this uh, uh, sector uh, a little bit more, people understand a little bit more how good a job, how good of paying jobs they are here, how good of life you, you, you can have here in PEI by going into our trades. And uh, I think we'll like to continue to work on that down the road. I'll also add too that uh, by ensuring that the investment is done in these post-secondary uh, education for students, that's how we keep them here. Mm -hmm. Rather than have them train and then move away, you want them to stay here to build the homes that we need for people who can't afford them right now, who can't get into them. So we need to be able to keep our students here after they've got the training and give them good jobs and lots of it. Mm -hmm. So that's good. You wanted to wait. Yeah, and sure. Go? I mean, I'm assuming some folks at home or maybe the media are fact-checking here today because Sharon said that the population of the island has doubled in the last little while. Now, that clearly is way out of whack. We have had an enormous increase in population, the fastest in the country, and that's created, so, again, some beautiful things, but some challenges. And the big difference between the Green Plan and our platform and any of the others is that we have significant investment in publicly built housing, almost $500 million over five years, this is something that previous governments have chosen not to invest in. They have allowed the, the, the private sector, not just primarily, but exclusively to try and meet our housing needs. And clearly it's not working. So we need governments to invest in public housing again, whether that's in new builds, whether it's in purchasing existing buildings or having first right of refusal when multi-unit units um, or uh, commercial buildings come on the market. That way we will be able to rebalance the supply and demand, which is the absolute basis of why we have such a, a problem with accessibility and pricing of housing here on Prince Edward Island. Peter, thank you for allowing me to clarify. What I meant was population growth went from 7,000 to 15,000. So that, that's what, what doubled the, was that number. As an educator, I also want to talk about, it's, it's easy for us to talk about um, programs from high school to, to post-secondary, but 30% of our kids don't make it to, to post-secondary. So one of the other things the Liberals are very committed to doing is finding a pathway so that we they don't get lost between high school and, and meander and, and somehow uh, get lost for six or seven years before they, they come back to us. So we want to make sure that we find pathways in junior high and high school um, to help guide people into those uh, labor market or trades jobs. So thank you for letting me clarify. That's great. Appreciate we, that. We have a 30 seconder now. <laughs> it's a very simple question. And we'll start with Sharon Cameron oh, for this one. So, so have a sip of water. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Miles Lord sent us this one sentence, one question. Is it time to get rid of Iraq? Sharon Cameron. You know, I, th I think Pete, I think we have legislation that um, protects us, and, and Iraq is one of those regulatory bodies, and I've worked for other regulatory bodies, but uh, that protects us from a whole lot of things. But I don't think, I don't think anything should ever be so far removed from government that we shouldn't look at its role, and we should be nimble and agile always, and uh, and and understand what role it is play, what role it does play, and in the current context. So I think I think everything should be looked at and monitored on a regular basis. Dennis King. I'd say it's a simple question, but it might not be a simple <laughs> answer. Uh, I think that Iraq does many things. They have a very, very broad scope of what they do under their regulatory framework. I would think uh, in my four years of experience, there are things they do really well. There are things they don't do so well. I think that uh, uh, people have asked me, would we do a review of Iraq and sort of update where we're at and what other jurisdictions in the country do? I think that would be a reasonable step. And I think anything uh, before we would eliminate something like a regulatory body, we should do a healthy review of what they do and how they do it first. So uh, not a simple answer. Michelle Neal. And here's one that I will actually agree with you, Dennis. I do <laughs> believe that we should do a review for sure and, and monitor exactly what it is that they are making decisions on. Because as an example, when they talked about the uh, decision to raise rents by 10% or 5% or whatever it was based on heat or not, in this time of crisis, a, a financial crisis for so many people, that was simply unreasonable. So I will give you credit that you stepped in. That's great. Wonderful that that happened. So, and I always give credit where credit is due. But yes, we definitely need to review and make sure that they are making good decisions in all respects. Peter Bevan Baker. There's always an appetite in the public for um, a yes, no answer to very many complex questions. And for me, and I, again, I would like to echo what, what Dennis and Michelle have just said. Iraq is, does, it covers a lot of ground. 
Um, but one of the things that I think they do well and I think would be really useful uh, for them to play a stronger role in is in enforcing the Lands Protection Act. Currently, final decisions are making, made in Executive Council, which means that you cannot get information about that. Let's put that in the hands of Iraq and let them present their rationale for making particular decisions, and the public, public would be able to, to request a, a review of that should they wish. Well, how is this for flow? <laughs> so no debate on that one. That was a shorter one. But Dennis King, <laughs> we're talking about land ownership on Prince Edward Island. There are so many issues. Decreasing farmland, beach access, shoreline developments, ownership limits. What would you change about how land is owned and how land is used on PEI? Well, we have committed to uh, following the Land Matters report to do a land use plan for PEI. I think we have to realize uh, as an agricultural province that is growing, that needs more spaces, we need to sort of determine, uh, have a plan to determine what we're going to be and how we're going to be it. So uh, uh, we will kick that into full gear, uh, which I think is long needed. But I, I think it's important for islanders to, to know, I know this is a popular topic, but we probably have the most strict land regulations in the country here in terms of uh, the process process you have to go through to purchase land or to transfer land. Uh, it is very comprehensive and matter of fact a lot of people who do business in PEI from outside of PEI will always ask why is it so uh, difficult. So we have overhauled the Land Protection Act. We've closed a number of the loopholes but it's another one of these pieces of legislation I think you need to continue to look at an overhaul and try to make it the best you can for a growing province, a small province like we have. Okay, Michelle Neal. So yes, we've heard uh, quite a few ex uh, complaints or, or concerns, I guess, that are risen by islanders from all over, mostly in the last uh, little while from the eastern end of the island with Point de Roche and a few other issues as well. So it's something <coughs> we have to listen to. But the biggest issue, I think, with our Land Protections Act is ensuring that we enforce the rules. The rules were made, yes, they were made by various different legislators before us and they were made for, for good reason. So I don't think that should be taken away. We need to enforce the rules that are there and ensure that islanders are listened to when it comes to a complaint that's coming forward because we don't always see exactly what's going on when we're in the legislature or doing other things. So we need to listen to what islanders bring up and make sure that we're making good decisions. Peter Baker. So I think islanders very clearly have lost faith in this government's ability to properly enforce and, and manage the Lands Protection Act. We see this in all kinds of areas. There are several things that need to be done. We need much more transparency when it comes to land purchases. We need more transparency when it comes to land ownership transfers. And we need more transparency in who actually owns this piece of land. Currently, it's an, arm, it's an enormously difficult task to figure out who owns what. The other thing that we need to do is actually follow the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, in my own district, we have people who, some, it's very difficult for some islanders to get permits to do any sort of development. Some select people don't even have to apply for a permit. They can just do whatever the heck they want, whenever they want, wherever they want. And that is a terrible, terrible thing. This, the, island, the islanders have lost faith in this government to, to look after the land. Sharon Cameron, what would you change about how land is owned and how it's used? Well, I, I'm not even sure that's the right question, Louise, but thank you. And I, um, I think in talking to people in the district and across PEI, I think there's another conversation that needs to be had, and that is, what do we want PEI to look like in 15 or 20 years? And as you heard from, from these three folks, it always defaults to land use or land ownership. And I think we need to, through a commission that we've uh, committed to establish, is to bring people to the table who maybe haven't been brought to the table before to have a conversation about how do we make sure we pass this beautiful island that we all love onto our children? How do we protect it? How do we nurture it? And how does that, how does that sit against kind of the, the kind of lackadaisical approach to the legislation we've already seen in the aberration of uh, Point de Rush? And, and where was the opposition at that time asking All that question? Open. We'll open up to debate on this one then. <laughs> Jump in. Okay, so one thing, <laughs> again, this comes, I mean, it's one of the things when you sit in opposition, absolutely you have an opportunity to have your voice heard and sometimes you can profoundly influence things. But let's not forget who's been in government for the last 20, 30, 40, 50, 180 years here. And it's the red team and the blue team. And one thing that they have failed to do for the last five decades is to em implement a land use plan from tip to tip on this province. And without a land use plan, the, the, the ability to control land use and land development is absolutely gone. We need a government that will commit, 
to producing a tip-to-tip -tip land use plan on this province, because without that, we, don't, we can't look after our farmland, we can't look after our beaches and our shorelines, we can't look after our forests, we can't develop our communities in a sustainable way. And again, 50 years of reports, of roundtables, of commissions have said the same thing. We need a land use policy and plan from tip to tip on this province. And these two parties have utterly failed islanders. But Peter, I, I understand that. And I, you know... Um, and, that you and have we're, failed but, but, islanders? No, no, that, that we need to mo look forward. I understand that, that there's been a, a number of land use commissions and land use reports, and I get that. <coughs> Um, but here's what I don't get. I don't get that, um, you know, when, when, and I'm going to bring up Point de Rush again, and I know again, but, but there's an example of a place that you could have taken a placard and a megaphone and stopped all of that when they were putting boulders on our beach, and you didn't do that, and you didn't apply the legislation. So don't talk to me about land use protection when neither one of you adhered to your own legislation, and you didn't kick up a stink until afterwards. So I want to make sure through a commission that we have First Nations, represented we have everybody who's not been in part of that conversation before and we raise it to a place where we say how do we protect our environment and and our against and balance that against our economic success and uh, and our social programs and all of that so i think there's a bigger conversation to be had here it's awfully cute that sharon thinks that somebody with a megaphone can stand in front of a, a and a placard can stand in front of a project like that and halt it when the weight of goodness knows how much money and a willing government to offer them the permits is on the other side. I stood up in the house, I asked numerous questions, I went to Point de Roche, I've seen it my, with my own eyes and it's a monstrosity and I can tell you that a green government would never allow that to happen. Thousands of tons of armoring rock dumped on a public beach blocking access to islanders, a footprint of a new building which is literally 10 times the size of the previous one, all done in the name of grandfathering and a, and a policy in government. This is an absolute failure of the current administration, but I have to tell you that the Liberals were no better when they were in power four years before that. We have to start I don't want to step in the middle of this altercation over here to my right, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I think we need to get back to the question, and that is how complex land use is here in Prince Edward Island. We're a small jurisdiction. We're an island province that is growing. Our population is growing. We've led the country in population growth for the last four or five years. We're living longer. We're staying longer in our rural communities, and to do that, we need to develop land that used to be in agriculture, but the, the complexity of all this is Agriculture is the number one industry within our province, so we have to be careful in how we do this and where we do this. We have to change regulations within our municipalities. We have to look at density. We need to build up instead of building out. So there's, whole, uh, there's a whole lot of components to this uh, that are going to require all of us working together. Uh, and if we're just going to sit here and fight with each other, I don't think we're going to make any progress. If we could work together and try to get some of these issues solved and come up with a long-term plan that all islanders can be proud of, and that can serve us well, that's what we should be doing. So I would say during COVID, when, when Dr. Morrison was leading us, us through that terrible pandemic, uh, you know, why, why the land use uh, wasn't, wasn't um, reviewed then during the downtime. So I would ask you that, Mr. Premier. <laughs> I don't know what downtime there was in COVID, but I guess maybe looking from the outside in, it might have looked like there was downtime, but I don't know if any other Prince Edward Islander would look at two years of a pandemic and uh, call it downtime. I meant downtime for you because we weren't in the legislation. So that's, sorry to, to clarify. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, we were, we were in the legislature. We the legislature. But <laughs> let, let me be clear that, that uh, the role of the Premier is that you have to be willing and able and expect to be do, do more than one thing at a time. All of the issues and concerns that, the, that Dennis King just cited in his answer there would be resolved if we had a land use plan. And again, we've had 50 years of advice from repeated studies which tell us that we need this. These two parties had opportunities to do that, to stop the Point de Roche from happening, to stop the 14,000 acres of farmland from disappearing forever on this province every year, and they did not do it. They have failed islanders. What scares me too, I will add, is when, a, when a, a big project like Point de Roche does happen and we go outside of the rules to approve it, that's really setting a precedent. We don't want to block our beautiful island beaches from everybody being able to walk on them. We're trying to ensure that islanders can stay active, right? That they can be healthy, 
We don't want to block beaches. That's a number one place for people to walk and to enjoy, take their, their puppy for a quick walk or something like that. Even in the wintertime, it is beautiful to walk on our beaches. We don't want to set that kind of precedence. It's just, it's not right. Thank right you. On. That was that was lively. It was good. Uh, Michelle Neal, you're actually up next to answer okay. the next question. And, and uh, Dennis King, you mentioned a, a growing population. Uh, so this question came from David McCallum. The population is growing and services on PEI are already stressed. How do you plan to balance things like housing needs, health care, access to vital services while still attracting people to come and live here? Well, that's something that I, I feel that we haven't met. When you bring people into a province, you really need to be able to support them with housing, with health care services, dental services, you name it. You have to be able to have the services available because it's not fair to them to ask them to come to PEI to prosper and not provide them some of those basic needs. So that's very unfair to people. So you need to ensure that those services are available to them. Invest in our public health care system. Invest in publicly run housing, and that's exactly what we're going to do in order to be able to support anyone who is coming here. Maybe it's our children that are coming back from training. Maybe it's seniors who are retiring back to PEI. You have to be ready for that kind of immigration, whether it's from outside of Canada or inside. We have to be smart about it. Green Party leader Peter Bevan-Bazer. So good government is good planning, and that's whether we're talking about a health care system, housing, land use planning, or the question before us right here. And the problem that we have had, and again, this was started by, that's a common theme tonight, you will hear from me. This is a problem that was started by a very aggressive population strategy by Wade McLaughlin. Um, I may even have preceded that, but he certainly was the one that, that uh, ramped it up. And there are, again, and we have to be careful here because there are lots of wonderful things that come from that, both in terms of economic development and in terms of the, the beautiful diversity that we have in our, in our province now. But if you don't twin that with proper planning of all the vital infrastructure to support these new people, they are going to suffer, and people who are already here are not going to have the services that, that, we, that we deserve and expect. Okay. Cameron. Thank you. So I'm here tonight because... Every... <laughs> We're looking back, I want to look forward. So the narrative we want for PEI is that you can come here and get a good job and employers can get good workers. You can find a place to live. You can have access to health care. You can have a good education for your kids. And by the way, we have yet to talk about education and outcomes for our kids and they're so badly disrupted. And that you can, you can hope to uh, retire with dignity and, and age with dignity. So I think that's the narrative we want to get back to. And I'm really proud of the plan that we have that's costed out over the next three years that addresses each one of those points through a, a labor market uh, plan, through uh, we talk about education objectives, but we, we will touch on all of those things. So I want to look forward, not back. And I can't own, I can't own that. I want to go forward. All right. Dennis King. Yeah, I think sometimes when we're here, we don't always appreciate how wonderful it is here. And the fact that uh, notwithstanding the challenges that we know we have, and we've talked about many of them tonight, but the fact that we lead the country in population growth shows that people want to choose to come and make their life here in Prince Edward Island. And that's an absolutely wonderful thing. The PEI that I grew up in in the 1970s is so vastly different than this wonderful, diverse culture that we have here now. And we're the better for it. And, and, and that's a wonderful thing. But it is intertwined with all of the number of things that we've talked about tonight. It's about housing. It's about access to health care. And it's about so many of these other important issues. But I don't think we should ever lose sight of the fact that people want to come here. And that's a great thing. And we should have an appreciation for how special a place this truly is in PEI. Debate? Well, I would say people used to want to come here. So now what I'm hearing <coughs> in the doorsteps is in the last four years, we've plummeted from having about 7,000 people on the registry to about 30,000. We've now gone from having to wait 17 weeks for surgery to 68 weeks. So the narrative is changing, which is why I said, you know, we want to be the place to be in 2023. So, but what I'm hearing on the doorsteps is we've got people uh, in healthcare who can't get jobs because they can't get into the system. So they're leaving or they're waiting six, eight to nine months. Um, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why that wouldn't have been addressed early on. And by the way, I, I, I also understand that we knew that the two doctors from Summerside were leaving. They knew that about eight months ago and said, oh, well, we'll just wait and see what happens. This can't be a wait and see province. We need to act now. 
Yeah. Why, are, why aren't we actually interviewing these doctors to find out why they're leaving? And nurses and anybody else who is leaving, we need to be doing those exit surveys so that we can understand why they're leaving, talk to them, figure it out, and then fix it. That's what we need well, to be doing. They've told us, Michelle, they, mm -hmm. they have no support and it's a toxic culture. That's why they're leaving. Exactly. That's what needs to change. So governing in a certain sense is succession planning. It's our prerogative, it's our responsibility as leaders in this province, and one of us will be Premier on April the 4th, to ensure that we are creating the best province we possibly can for our children and for, the, for everybody else's children who live here. And as long as we have governments that pursue short-sighted um, policies, whether that's to welcome all of the economic activity and increased tax revenues that come with it, with an increased population without actually providing the services and the facilities to make sure that our community is still that inclusive, cohesive place that we all love and want Prince Edward Island to be, we're going to be in big trouble. Do you remember a few years ago that the Liberals were going to cl close schools, rural schools in Belfast and Georgetown and not so rural school in St. Jean here in, in, in Charlottetown? Can you imagine the crisis in our education system now if that had gone ahead? Now, one of the people standing before you was out there protesting at that short-sighted policy. It was very clear what was going to happen. And that's just in education, but in all of the other facets. We need a government that will have a balanced approach that recognizes that, yes, economic growth that comes from population growth is a wonderful, desired thing, but we cannot look... We cannot do that without looking at all of the vital services that have to go along with it. There's yeah. basic needs that need to be met. Housing. You know, food security, affordability. If people can't come here and afford to be able to live here, they're not going to stay. They're going to go elsewhere. We're going to lose that wonderful training that they've received when they come here. So yeah. I'd like to just draw on a, a point that uh, Mr. Bevan Baker made, and I'd like to ask the Premier, speaking of education, uh, I understand that the policies haven't been updated, ministers' directives haven't been updated. They're, uh, people inside the system are, are having to rely on their corporate memory. What is the plan for education in terms well, of I outcomes? I was ans asking the questions yeah. here. <laughs> oh, is this in continuation of this? Yeah. Of this? No, it doesn't sound like it, which is why I said yeah. Well, we were talking about balancing uh, population growth yeah, with, population with population vital needs, area. so if you want to answer it, a question about... I, I, look, I, I'm, I know others are finding it easier to disagree. I'm finding it hard to disagree with what a lot of Peter is saying in terms of the balanced approach that is required. That's the approach that we've been trying to take. But the reality is we're playing considerable catch-up. I'm not trying to point fingers in the past. Uh, I'm in the job. I've been in the job for four years. I've been trying hard to move it forward. We're playing significant catch-up in terms of making sure the, the housing is where it needs to be and so many of the other services. But uh, a balanced approach to growing our population is what will make our province wonderful, uh, even more more wonderful and make it more diverse and, and just one of the most amazing places that you could be in the world. So that, that should be our approach. That should be all of our approach, Happy. All right, no debate on this one. This is a <laughs> one. Uh, this one's from Instagram. Um, so PEI, Peter Brevin Baker, you have this one, um, has the highest inflation in the country since March of 2021. We are one of only four provinces who do not adjust income tax brackets to account for inflation. A lot of people say that is one way we can combat high inflation. Will you commit to doing that? Yes, that's the easiest answer of the night in question. Absolutely, along with another bunch of tax uh, incentives and policies that need to come forward, we would index uh, tax brackets in, in, to inflation, and that's in, right there in our platform, fully costed. We would also provide uh, low income, we would increase the low income tax threshold, and we would provide a refundable tax credit for those islanders who are earning between thirty and $50,000. It, it would decrease the tax for over 10,000 islanders. Sharon Cameron, will you commit to adjusting income tax brackets to inflation? Sure, I'd, I'd commit to doing that, but I think the first thing we have to ask is where are we as a province? We don't have that financial information right now. Uh, one, and, and like Peter, we would do some other things to, um, to um, uh, increase social assistance supports and, and provide other supports to people who are vulnerable, because that's what Liberal governments do. We have a balanced approach. We need the economy to be running well, but we also want to take care of the people who are vulnerable in our province. So, but we need to know what the financial situation is to make a responsible decision, too. 
Dennis King, yeah, will you commit? Well, yeah, we have committed in our platform to, to looking at, we currently have three brackets now. We, we, we look to, to move that to five so people at the lower end of the spectrum can keep more money in their pocket. I think that's a fair thing and to make sure it's indexed accordingly. Uh, uh, but they also, I think what you're talking about in a bigger scope is just how you can continue as a government to try to help people through the difficult times of a rising cost of living. Uh, you know, we've frozen uh, tax rates uh, for, uh, for waste watch, we've frozen property tax. We've tried to help out using most of the levers we could use uh, in a difficult time and that's what I would continue to try to do but I think we need to help also to put more money and keep it in the pockets of Islanders. Michelle, Neil, the question was about yes. income tax brackets. Absolutely, we would certainly review them and, and determine what is the best thing for Islanders. We would also look at our, our current tax brackets as well and look at the uh, the progressive taxation system that we currently do have, because those who profit most from the economic growth, which is our high, um, inc high income earners and our large corporations, they're the ones who are getting all the tax breaks. That needs to stop. We need to ensure that they pay their fair share so that all islanders can benefit. And we need to ensure also that we give back more of that provincial portion of the HST. Basically, we're offering to double that for okay. islanders. Thank you. So another 30 seconder now, so no debate. We want to get to as many questions as we can. This one came from Patsy Young. Sharon Cameron, you're up first. Do any of the candidates feel a sense of urgency to have tolls on the Confederation Bridge reduced? And I'll continue with that. If Ottawa isn't prepared to fund a reduction in tolls, what else would you do to help Islanders on that front? You know, the, the, again, this is a, not a yes or no question, and it's very complicated. And I go back almost to Confederation, and I think about, um, you know, there was uh, some agreements made about making sure that we have passage to the mainland. Um, and we also, we want to make sure that whatever we do on one end of the island, we don't impact the other end. So we have a ferry service down in the eastern end of PEI, so we don't want to jeopardize that in any way. Uh, we also have people with severe, uh, serious health it, uh, issues, so we want to make sure that it's, it's affordable for them if they have chemo treatments and things like that. But I think this is a very complicated uh, conversation that we need to have. Dennis King. Uh, I have been working with the federal government to strike a federal provincial committee to uh, work towards reducing the tolls at the Confederation Bridge and the uh, Northumberland Ferry System in Wood Islands to $20. Uh, it's a commitment that I've gotten from Dominic LeBlanc, the federal minister of infrastructure, that we can work on this. Uh, it is a complicated agreement that the federal government has with a private operator uh, uh, to deliver um, the service that is required, but I do think it's unfair that we're paying a high rate uh, when the similar cost cost of a project in Montreal uh, doesn't require the citizens of Montreal to have a, a fare uh, to cross their bridge. So we're, we're committed to working on it and I'd like to get it to $20 as fast as possible. Michelle Neal. So yeah, so I think we need to be working both with our federal counterparts as well as provincial too. And, and we need to ensure that that bridge can be uh, funded properly through buying back basically and making it a public service so that we can do the proper subsidization that we may need to do. The freezing of fees for 2023 just doesn't go far enough, especially for our low income earners. And, and as, as Sharon mentioned, the people who are having to go off island for medical services. Those are the kinds of things that we need to ensure that that's free because people just can't afford that, especially if they're in a medical situation where they're having to pay for extra medication or whatever the case may be. Thank you. Peter Redenbaker. In politics, nothing is ever as simple as it appears. Those who have been involved in the inside for a while, it's never as simple as you, as you imagine. And that's not to say that we cannot or should not be pressing for something to be done about the, the outrageous fees that we have to pay to get off our island and visit the rest of our country. And in our platform, we, we commit, as Dennis has just said, to talk with, the, of course, it's the federal government because we're talking about an interprovincial service here and also the private owners of the bridge SCI. In order to do something, we, we're going to have to sit down with all of these partners. It is possible, and I'd love to, uh, I'd love to be able to do that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Dennis King, we'll begin the next question with you. Uh, Paul Arsenault sent us this. We are going to have more storms like Fiona and more frequently according to all the experts. Things need to happen on this island to prepare for that. What are your priorities? Yeah, I think uh, Fiona and Dorian before that has left most islanders feeling quite vulnerable, to be honest. I, I do think we need to continue to work with our uh, the UPEI Climate Change and Adaptation Lab in St. Peter's to follow the science and research to allow us to develop good policy that can help protect 
uh, and adapt our province heading forward. I've been working with the federal government to try to come up with a 15-year plan that would do things like help protect our shorelines, that would help bury uh, our power lines, and, and a number of different initiatives like that, which could help us make a little bit more, make us a little bit more adaptable and less vulnerable in a diff difficult situation. But the reality is we live in a very, very changing time. Uh, nobody needs to explain climate change to a Prince Edward Islander. We lived through it here for the last, uh, in September, and it was a devastating time. And uh, we have to, we're committed to being uh, as, as, as fast as we can be to make this island as adaptable as it can be. All right, thank you. Michelle Neal. Thank you. Uh, Hurricane Fiona definitely was the reminder that Climate change is here. It's, it's not something that's happening in the future. It's, it's here already, right? And it's something that islanders need to come together to ensure that we can be prepared for the next system because we know it's coming. Um, some islanders were, were without power for three and four weeks. That's not only scary and unacceptable, it's downright unsafe, really, because uh, people didn't have uh, refrigeration for their food and that kind of thing. So we have to have a better plan for climate resiliency. We have to invest in burying our power lines, as, as Dennis had mentioned as well. We need to fund our municipalities to ensure that they can have their climate infrastructure ready to go. We need Our long-term vision includes 100% publicly owned island source renewable energy grid, and we're going to work that work toward that in the future. Peter Revan Baker. The leaders across the world when it comes to pressing the alarm button on climate change are small island states because they are the most vulnerable when it comes to issues like Fiona. And Prince Edward Island, we may not be a state, but we are a subnational jurisdiction. I think it's our absolute responsibility to be the leader in Canada and in one of the leaders in the world to say we need to do, we need action now. When it comes to our response to Fiona, uh, we need a public inquiry because without a public inquiry, third parties like Maritime Electric, like the telecoms and like Red Cross will be left out of the picture. We will not know what went wrong. We will not know why people were left, seniors were left without power for two weeks unless we can get these people to come and sit down, and that requires a public inquiry. And again, this government has failed islanders in that regard. Sharon Cameron. Thank you. So first of all, I, I think that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have more of these significant events. Um, and one of the things that um, I think we, if we'd go back to our earlier conversation, first of all, I think we need to have that land use commission um, and the environmental impacts, climate change, and I think should all be part of that conversation. I also think that we, we need to think about our response, but there's a couple of questions that come out of this for me, and one was, I worked in government, uh, and I remember we had business continuity plans back in government, so every department knew what their action was going to be. Then I find out that, um, you know, that the, the senior people inside government were in acting positions for 17 months to two years. Uh, and like Peter, I agree. I think we need to really do a, a, a look and a review at our, our response. Thank you, Louise. Okay, we're going to open it up for debate, so you can weigh back in if you like. Uh, debate on this one. I think Michelle raises a good point, about, but our electrical grid resilience is something that we need to invest some time and money in and, and work with the federal government uh, to make sure that we can provide that resilience. But we also need some on-island generating capacity uh, of, of, a, of a green or clean capacity as well uh, in times of... Uh, of, of difficulty. I mean, we're connected through three submergible cables to New Brunswick in terms of providing our electricity, and that's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing for us, but uh, it also leaves us a little bit vulnerable to, to nature and some other things. So we need to come up with some plans, and uh, Minister Myers and others in his department have been working on some long-term contingency planning around uh, improving our electrical grid resilience, but also some on-island green, clean uh, energy capacity as well. Exactly, because we certainly <clears throat> saw during Fiona that a lot of the trees were either leaning on or, or bringing down completely our lines, right? So by burying them, I think we would have a much more resilient system to be able to do, to deal with any kind of climate, climate issues that are going to come in the future, for sure. So the Fiona fiasco was uh, one of the most awful things that I have experienced since I moved to Prince Edward Island. Uh, we had seniors in publicly owned homes without power, without light, without heat, for two weeks. We had people lining up at five o'clock in the morning, driving from all corners of this island, just to prove to the Red Cross that they were who they said they were. And many times, I've met them on the campaign trail over the last couple of weeks, they would arrive at the mall in the, in the <coughs> dark, 
and they would be told that there were no places left. This government did a dreadful job of looking after islanders. And unless we do a full review, we will never know whether, for example, power to seniors' homes. Was that re the responsibility of Maritime Electric to make a decision about where that lay in the, in the list of priorities? Or was it government's choice? I would like to think that it would be government's choice that when we have seniors in the dark and the cold, that they are the ones that can call the shots and say, this is a priority. But apparently that's not the case. But you know what? I'm not going to be able to know that. None of us is going to be able to know that unless we have a public inquiry. Anyone else? Uh, Any time you have a catastrophic event like that, you should have a very comprehensive review, whether it takes the form of a public inquiry. Uh, I know uh, throughout, uh, since the days of uh, Fiona uh, and, and our response, uh, there's been uh, very, very comprehensive work done at the standing committee level. They've asked a lot of difficult questions. We're learning a lot more. Uh, we need to learn from all of this. So we have committed to doing a review. We will do that. Uh, we will Good learn enough. from that. Uh, and, and, you know, the, it's the reality of, of, of life we're in here right now. This will be uh, the new reality, it seems, in terms of catastrophic events. We have to learn from the last one. We learned from Dorian. Uh, we'll learn from Fiona, and we'll try to make our province more resilient. Uh, and uh, you always should be learning and, and, and trying to glean as much information as you can. And we've, we've committed to doing that, and we will. And we, won't, we will not be able to gain all the information that we need unless we have a public inquiry. Let me be really clear to Islanders on that. We will not be able to find out how much of a problem it was that Maritime Electric was not under the control of this government, that the Red Cross were delivering things so appallingly, and that the, the, the telecoms lost 911 service for how, we don't know how long. If we want to learn all that we can to make sure that we are better prepared next time, we must have a public inquiry. A review is not good enough. One thing I will add, too, is there are lots of wonderful volunteers that do work for the Red Cross, but you know what? The Red Cross is not equipped, either technology-wise or volunteer-wise, to deliver such a huge program that they were asked to do. And I know you were trying to get money out fast to Islanders. I get that because they needed it. I totally get that. But that is definitely a program that needed to be done by government because you have the information that the Red Cross didn't, and that was, I think, part of the delay. So in hindsight, I think it needs to be run by government for sure for something that important. All right. Thank you. Pride PEI has asked for definitive, tangible action to address the rise in hate speech and acts of violence directed at its community. What will you do, and Michelle Neal, you take this one first, to ensure their voices are heard and that they feel safe in our province? Absolutely. Island communities are diverse. They're more diverse now than they have ever been, right? We have... For, for way too long. We've had top-down decisions that have left islanders without a voice for shaping their world, right? And in, in specifics, in the, in the legislature, we don't see and hear people who have these experiences. So we need to be more diverse in who we offer as candidates as well, which is something we've been trying to do for the last little while. Um, New Democrats are committed to building a province, certainly, where islanders of all backgrounds have a voice. That's why we have a diverse number of candidates that are offering in this election. We support the Citizens' Assembly as well on electric electoral reform to examine alternatives to, for the first past the post so we can get some of these people into the legislature and ensure that your voices are heard. Peter Bevan Baker. I think there's two ways that islanders can assess the commitment of the various parties to this. One is to look at our platforms and you will find a number of elements in the Green Party platform regarding tangible differences that will be made, both in terms of our relationships with Indigenous people and also with, with the entire BIPOC community. And I think you can also look at our record of action over the last four years. The Green Party was there when they needed to be. We were there at Elliott River to support the youth who were feeling unsafe in their school. We were there when members of the community were advocating for better health services. We met with them. We understand where the gaps are in Prince Edward Island. We have spoken to this numerous times in the legislature through question period and through member statements. The Green Party is there for minority, uh, for minority populations here on Prince Edward Island. Sharon Cameron. This is a really complicated issue, but what I'd like to start out by saying is, first of all, we have to stop discrimination of any kind before it starts. So it's, it's through education, it's through advocacy, it's through uh, conversation, it's through including everybody in the conversation that we will learn from each other uh, and learn acceptance and tolerance and, and um, 
and just the compassion that we all need as we, as we all move forward on this new island in, in a new way. One of the things that we want to do, though, is um, when education and all the prevention and proactive uh, actions aren't enough, we want to appoint a, um, an independent diversity and inclusion commissioner and, and to make sure that that office is staffed up and, and uh, will gather information on inclusion and diversity. Um, but it's going to provide a backstop so that when things don't work, uh, we'll have some, some measures and some, some recourse. Thank you. Dennis King. Yeah, you know, I look at this simply from the position of just being a parent. When, when our three kids were born, I, I mean, all I want for my kids are to be to be happy, to be healthy, to be respectful, to be respected, and to have a, to live their best life. And that's what we all should want for every citizen of this province. Uh, and we should also work to make sure this province is a place where they can be that here. And you know, I think we have worked. Uh, we have led a very progressive government. Uh, we, we've worked with with the BIPOC community. We worked with the uh, First Nations community. Uh, we've signed treaty education MOUs with the First Nation. Truth and Reconciliation Day is a statutory holiday. Uh, you know, and we continue to uh, to expand our, our, our policies in that regard. But I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a thing in PEI where you can never stop learning, you can never stop asking questions, uh, but uh, it should be also from a place of respect uh, for those who, uh, who live here and call this place home. A any debate on this one for anyone? Yeah, I'll, I'll add a couple of things too that as a person with a disability and lots of friends who also have a disability, they're not always seen, obviously, but even for those that are seen in physical, for people in wheelchairs, for people who have mobility issues, which can also include our seniors, there needs to definitely be the, um, we have to be compliant with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I understand we also want to work more toward ensuring that all the calls for the truth and reconciliation, calls to action on the commission, anything that has a provincial uh, implementation. We need to work on that as well. And of course, the United uh, Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So it's ensuring that everyone feels comfortable and, and safe in their own island. Yeah. Louise, we have an anti-racism table here, an initiative of this government, and it's a wonderful one. But no recommendations from that table have ever been made public. So I'm, I'm really not sure what their recommendations are. And without that, it's difficult to know what the concerns and the needs of the communities most affected and who need to be worked with, in, in, who need to have a voice in this discussion uh, are. So I, I think we have to develop an anti-racism strategy and, and that has to come in, in partnership with the community members from, with, from the BIPOC community. Um, again, I would love to see the recommendations from the, the round table that we have. We also need to increase funding to the Human Rights Commission because so many of the problems that we have will or have ended up with them and, and they're over overwhelmed with work at the moment. So we need the, 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 the body which is tasked with dealing with this to be properly funded so they can do their job properly. I just also say that uh this is one of the areas where in the legislature, through our collaboration, uh, uh, there was some questions that came from Peter around the missing, uh, murdered ind Indigenous women and girls report, along with the Truth and Reconciliation uh, uh, report. Uh, and he asked in the legislature if we would report back the progress each and every year. Uh, and we do that, and, and, and we've done that for, I think it's two or three sessions now. So this is a, one of these areas of collaboration where this isn't really about political parties or it, it's really about trying to do the best we can for Islanders but that's one little collaboration that we've done and there have been many that I think that I know I'm proud of and I hope Peter's proud of as well. Okay. Peter Brevin Baker you get to start this next question from Jill Walsh. What is your party's vision of PEI in 20 years from now and what will you put in place to achieve that vision? Mm, I love this question. Um, our platform is laid out in things that we need to do immediately because in five years, this is where we want to be. So that the vision that we have for this province in, in the, the question cited 20 years is here. And in order for any government to lead well, it has to know where it's going. If you don't know where you're going, you can't lead. And I think that's been one of the real failures, again, of this current government is that I'm not sure they have a strong idea of what their vision of this province is. And if you don't have that, you can't build plans towards that vision. And if you're not building plans, you can't execute those plans. So a green vision would absolutely be of a healthy, inclusive, prosperous island for all islanders. And we will put the plans in place which are in our platform right now in order to lay the foundation for that now. Sharon Cameron. 
So the Liberals have a, a really good platform as well that I'm very proud to present, and it's costed out and it's responsible. Uh, it's based on economic analysis, and it's a really good balance between economy and social programs and environmental caretaking. So I think we have to have a balance in all of those things. We need to make sure our primary industry and all of our private sector is functioning well, that we do what we're really good at, is taking care of the people who are vulnerable, who, who need our help, and that we do that on an island that we're proud of, that has a balance between this kind of uh, conflict between agriculture and growth and development, but that we have a vision for what that successful balance looks like. Thank you. Dennis King. Well, as, as you can tell here tonight, I, I and we've been heavily critiqued in many areas, but I take that critique in good nature and I, I try to learn from it. And actually, one of the things that I've tried to incorporate into our style of governing is that plan that Peter talks about to look beyond the four-year increments that we've always looked or uh, in the electoral process and to try to build. Uh, so I give him credit for that. I don't know if it's stealing the idea if I give credit for that idea, but we, we've tried to employ a lot of that within our planning because I think it's important. But when I look at PEI in the next 20 or 30 years, I hope we can be the destination where clean technology and the new jobs of cleaning the environment are, are here and that we're a leader in that. Uh, and and I, I hope that we can be a good, safe place and a respectful place where people can live, work and raise a family here. Uh, I think it's the most special place in the world. We have lots of challenges, but I think we should be proud to be from here. And I think we can build a really, really special place into the future. Thank you, Michelle Neal. Thank you. Uh, it's one of those things that you have to ensure that anyone who does live here currently has the proper supports in place that they need to be able to live a good and prosperous life so that they can welcome other people. So you need to ensure that our healthcare system is good, that our education system is well funded and providing the proper supports that we need, that we have lots of affordable housing, not just housing, but affordable and accessible housing. If you can provide the basic needs for all islanders, including what we want to bring in is a basic income guarantee as well. You're going to give people dignity. They're going to be able to afford their, their homes, their groceries, their uh, medications if need be. Whatever the case may be, if you have all of that taken care of, people are going to start giving back to the island through the economy and welcome others to it. So that's what we need to do. All right, let's open this one up for debate. It might be the last opportunity to have a bit of a debate before we say so, goodnight. So I'd like to start. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> First of all, we all have plans. Um, that are costed out and, 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 and were presented in a timely fashion. I guess I'd like to ask the Premier why it seemed like your plan was kind of dumped at the last minute at 4 o'clock, which is a little bit disrespectful to the public. Uh, but then I've been very critical um, in the past about uh, not accounting to the public, not coming back to the legislature, particularly in health care, asking questions when... Derek Key resigned and, and all of those things. So I, I guess I would ask, why did you wait till 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon to give a plan uh, that people didn't really have good time to review? Well, I think everybody brings forward a platform, and I think I've demonstrated over four years that I, I really don't care where the good ideas are coming from. I, I don't stand here and try to boast that the PC plan is the only plan. It's the only thing we should follow. I think there's some really, really good stuff in here, but I think there's also really good stuff in the other platforms as well. And I think a responsible leader, which I've tried to be over the last four years, that we should take some of those components and put them into practice if they're good, if they will help people. Uh, we've done that over the last four years. Uh, nobody owns the good ideas. That's the way that I've operated. Uh, I think we've been out there sharing our plan with Islanders, uh, and it's been, uh, there's a great response to it, but uh, the there's other wonderful ideas in the other three-party platforms that I certainly want to review uh, and see what we can incorporate. If they can make life better for Islanders here, I think we all should work together to implement them. We have about one minute left for debate. Okay, That's so good. I got into politics uh, when my children were born, and I did that because I could look ahead and see the world that they were going to have to grow up in, and I didn't like what I saw, whether that was from an economic point of view, whether it was from a social point of view, or whether it was from an environmental point of view. And in order to change the future, you have to have an idea of where you want to go. You have to have a clear vision of what you want to accomplish. And here on Prince Edward Island, we need an island that takes care of the things that take care of us. That is our land, that is our forests, it is the water, 
We need to take care of our communities because that's where we live together and that's where we depend on each other. And we need to take care of the health of the individual islanders on this province. And in order to do all of that, you have to have a clear vision of what you want to accomplish. And, and the Green Party does. And you also have to have good opposition, which over the last four years, uh, collaboration between the two parties has, has resulted in a lot of negative results. So I just wanted to, to remind people about that. Too. Quick, quick final word from and you, I since will. you didn't get in on this, but quick, Thank because you. we've got to get to closing statements. All right. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we were the first to put out our platform. We wanted it out very, very quickly so Islanders could see what the NDP is all about. We are hard workers. We're uh, average people that live all over the island, and we are prepared to fight for all of you. We're actually beginning with you for closing okay. statements, so why don't Thank you take you. that away? We're going in the opposite order as we began tonight. Peter Brevenbaker kicked us off. Michelle Neal, you start us off to say goodbye. Awesome. So to the viewers, thank you very much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. To my opponents, thanks for the lively debate. It's been, it's been a pleasure, really. Elections are about ensuring that the legislature and the elected MLAs reflect you and your ideas. I believe the status quo isn't enough. When new Democrats are elected, we believe we can create a better island when we lift everyone up. So when islanders have a properly funded and public health care system that is fully accessible by all, and it keeps those hospitals like Western Hospital open, when you have a paycheck that you can ensure that all of your needs are met, that's a good thing. When your family can find a home that is affordable, when seniors can retire in dignity and get the care that they need, either at home if, if they can still be there, or at the hospitals or long-term care. When young people can put down roots and get a good job here. When parents know that they'll get the supports that they need when they're at their uh, kids' schools, that's the island that I know is possible. A vote for candidates such as Dr. Herb in District 25 and Marion in District 8 is a vote to support our precious health care system. And a vote for any new Democrat is a vote for a better deal for islanders. If we want a better future, we must make different choices. I humbly ask for your vote on April 3rd. Thank you very much, Michelle Neal. PC uh, leader, Dennis King. Thank you, Louise, and thank you to all of my colleagues for being here tonight, and thank you to Islanders for tuning in. It takes a lot of courage to stand up here and to present ideas, and I'm proud of how we've all done that here tonight. Uh, we've been through a lot in the last four years. Uh, I said we've been through a lot together, but we've accomplished a lot together, and it's been a great privilege for me to be the premier of this province through that difficult time. Elections are about the next four years, and it's about the future, and they're about leadership. It's about who can lead the province forward over the next four years. We have been a government that has worked with you and for you. Over the last four years, we have demonstrated through good times and through some very difficult times that we will stand there with you, and we will walk every step of the way with you to get through these difficult times, and that will never change. If I'm fortunate enough to be elected Premier on April the 3rd. I will continue down the path we're on. I will collaborate broadly. I will work for the best, to do the best I can to help Islanders and to make this place the best place to live, work, and raise a family. So thank you very much. I ask for your support. And thank you. Merci. Thank you. Sharon Cameron. Thank you. First, I want to thank CBC for hosting this debate. I want to thank my colleagues. This has been a wonderful experience. I place great value on the CBC, and unlike the Premier, I'm consistent in my admiration for your work, whether the lights are on or whether the lights are off. I also want to thank everyone who is watching, and we have a wonderful democratic uh, tradition on Prince Edward Island, and it's your commitment to public affairs that keeps that reality alive and well. I also want to thank everyone who we hear is gathered outside of the building making their views about health care known to all Islanders. We hear you. The Premier clearly views this election as a big personal thank you tour, and we've seen evidence of that. Well, I think health care workers are the ones who deserve our gratitude, and you have mine. The Liberal Party has put together a program and a platform that is balanced. Our plans address health care, education, the cost of living impacts. Thank you. Sharon Cameron, thank you very much. Peter Bevan Baker. Islanders have to ask themselves some very big questions in this election. Is life better after four years of a Dennis King government? Is the healthcare system better? No, it's not. Is the housing crisis, has that improved? No, it has not. Has the cost of living that all Islanders are faced with these days and the rapid inflation, is that better? No, it's not. Is the protection of our island beaches, of our forests, of our fields, of our waterways, is that better? Again, no, it's not. It's time for a new government. In our green platform, we will give islanders back their healthcare system. We will make a big dent 
in the housing crisis, which has been getting worse for so long. We will provide tax relief to burdened islanders and real changes in inflation relief. We will finally protect our beaches and our forests and our farmland. And finally, we will give islanders the honest, transparent government that they are craving. On, on April the 3rd, I ask you to vote for a government that you can truly trust, a green government. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us this evening for this debate. I really appreciate it. You can breathe now. The hard part's <laughs> over, okay? <laughs> and I want to thank our viewers, our listeners on radio, our online viewers as well, on television, Facebook, wherever you watched us tonight. I want to say a huge thank you to you at home. These are your questions. This is your election. You need to vote on April 3rd. Have a wonderful evening. Good night, PEI.